Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing of the Finance Committee. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum and I'm Chair of the Committee. Today's hearing will examine the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget of Thrive NYC. I'm joined by my colleagues Steve Matteo, uh, Vanessa Gibson, Adrian Adams, Rory Lansman, Diana Ayala, Keith Powers, Helen Rosenthal, Jimmy Van Bramer, and Bob Holden, and others may join us shortly. Uh, we are pleased to be joined today by the First Lady of the City of New York, Shirlene McRae, and Senior Advisor to the Mayor, Susan Herman, who is heading up the newly created Office of Thrive. We're also joined by David Greenberg from OMB. In January 2015, First Lady McRae developed a partnership between the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Fund for Public Health to create a roadmap for a more inclusive mental health system in New York City. That roadmap was unveiled in November 2015 as Thrive NYC. Funding and programs for Thrive NYC were first reflected in the city's budget in the fiscal 2017 preliminary budget released in January 2016. According to the Office of Management and Budget, Thrive NYC is currently comprised of 55 initiatives spread across 15 city agencies, with the majority of the funding being in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The fiscal 2020 preliminary budget for Thrive is $251.8 million. Because Thrive is spread out across so many agencies, tracking Thrive within the city's budget has presented itself to be quite challenging. This is largely due to two factors. First, when Thrive NYC was rolled out, from a budgetary standpoint, there was no clear delineation between funding and existing funding. While it seemed like the majority of the funding associated with Thrive was already included in the budget, the Council has not been able to independently track this in the City's financial management system. To that end, the Council appreciates the steps that the Administration is taking to address this going forward. However, the Council still hopes that the Administration will produce a list of budget codes that make up the spending on Thrive so we can do a, a historical fiscal analysis of spending. Second, there is no uniform naming convention within the budget for Thrive. A few programs actually have the word Thrive in it, but some are just marked Roadmap, and yet others are only described by their program name. Therefore, it has been difficult for the Council or the public to complete a crosswalk of all Thrive funding within the budget. Looking back at Thrive NYC's funding for the first three years it existed, $490 million was budgeted, but only 70% of that, or $344 million, was spent. In fiscal 2019, an additional $250.9 million was budgeted. The committee hopes to learn today about the amount of year spending for fiscal 2019, the breakdown between personal, service, personal services and other personal services, as well as the headcount numbers for the initiative supported by the budget. The Council certainly commends the First Lady for attempting to tackle such a widespread but too often taboo topic. But Thrive NYC is a large component of the City's budget. Therefore, the goal of today's hearing is to subject it to the same budget oversight that all agencies and major programs receive and to learn more about the budget fundamentals and building blocks that make up Thrive. On a logistical matter, I want to remind any member of the public who wishes to testify to please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms. The public portion of the hearing is scheduled to begin at approximately 4 p.m after the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction hears testimony from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Also, Council members will be limited to two, min to two minutes of questioning uh, during this uh, portion of the hearing. If there is any member of the public who wishes to testify but is unable to do so in person today, they may email their testimony to the Finance Division at financetestimony at council.nyc.gov by close of business on Friday, March 29th and the staff will make it a part of the official record. I'd like to thank the staff of the Council's Finance Division for their work and support in preparing for this hearing. Thank you to Unit Head Krillian Francisco, finance, uh, Financial Analyst Lauren Hunt, and Senior Counsel Rebecca Chasen. Okay. 
Okay, and um, Councilmember Ayala does want to make a statement before we go to um, the testimony. Councilmember Ayala. Thank you, Chair Drum. I would like to extend a warm welcome to the First Lady of the City of New York, our Shalane McCrane, and the Senior Advisor to the Mayor, Susan Herman, who now has the Office of Thrive NYC. The critical work of ensuring access to quality behavioral health care to the people of New York City is no small task, and we applaud the First Lady and Thrive, the, the Thrive team for the important work that it has done and will continue to do. To that end, we look forward to learning more about the fiscal components of the Thrive Initiative so that we may better understand and support Thrive's mission. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the public advocate would also like to make a statement. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Ella. Uh, thank you, uh, First Lady and uh, Susan Herman. As many know, uh, and I recently made uh, much more public, open dialogue about mental health is very important and personal to me. Uh, but we need to figure out what the tangible metrics are so that we can recognize the impact. Thrive NYC is an $850 million initiative that was founded with the mission of supporting mental well-being of New Yorkers. That's an admirable but a very broad mission, and I want to thank the First Lady for even uh, trying to tackle this when many people didn't. From what I could see on um, public statements that were put forward, the goals were announced as a change the culture, act early, close treatment gaps, partner with communities, use data better, strengthen the government's ability to lead. Uh, recently, the Comptroller released a letter saying that the city was not tracking outcomes for nearly 75% of the programs that are part of Thrive NYC, and the program's own staff notes it's too early to say if the pricey plan works. Tangible results are clear uh, in terms of EDP and policing instances. There has been a sharp increase in 9-11 calls for EDP solutions. Uh, as we know, police are not always the best to call, or at least they shouldn't be the only ones to respond. Uh, if we can intervene prior to or even at the time with medical attention. Um, we do know that one of the initiatives was crisis intervention training. There was another report that stated I think about a third, if that much, uh, police officers have been uh, trained in crisis intervention training. Uh, I wanted to, I'm hoping from this hearing we can find out if there's coordination between those uh, me and measure them against the stated goals, but then to see what goals we can set moving forward and if they can, uh, if they should or need to change. Uh, two quick things, I, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about mental illness uh, itself. And I always want to make sure, I hope we're having a discussion, two separate issues, uh, mental illness and the acute need to f deal with mental illness itself, and then mental health for the rest of us. Um, and I think there are two separate combinations that are connected, but often uh, too, too many times uh, mixed together. And I would like to have a better understanding of which uh, or either at NYC was focused on and what the metrics were for both of those because I see them as uh, slightly separate. And lastly, uh, uh, f after uh, initial resistance by the mayor uh, with the insistence of this uh, council, uh, there was an EDP task force that was set up to see how EDP uh, calls are treated and people who are emotionally disturbed uh, from beginning to, to end. And uh, there was supposed to be a report put out by January of this year. Uh, we haven't seen the report yet, and I'm hoping to also hear a testimony if the uh, Thrive MSC is working with that task force as well. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. And thank you, Mr. Public Advocate uh, Jamani Williams. We'll now hear from the First Lady, Charlene McRae, Senior Advisor Susan Herman, and David Greenberg from OMB after this sworn in by counsel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Okay, hey, please begin. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Thrive NYC's important work to improve the mental health and well-being of our city's people, families, and communities. I am joined at the table today by Susan Herman, Senior Advisor to the Mayor and Director of the Office of Thrive NYC, and David Greenberg, Associate Director for Health and Social Services at the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. As some of you may know, Thrive NYC was officially launched in November of 2015 as a plan to guide the city toward a more effective and holistic behavioral health system. My own personal experiences called me to this work. I saw the effects of untreated mental illness and unaddressed trauma in my immediate and extended family, beginning with my parents when I was just a child. 
I saw how the stigma surrounding diseases like depression, alcoholism, and bipolar disorder can prevent people from seeking help or even from understanding and talking about what they're going through. So many New Yorkers know what it feels like to struggle with mental illness and substance use disorders. Even more know what it feels like to worry about a loved one. With one in five New Yorkers suffering from a mental health condition in any given year, the other four in five are family members, friends, coworkers, neighbors, who often don't know what to do or where to turn. We are all affected. In early 2015, City Hall and the Department of, Mental, of, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene began working closely together to address this widespread public health challenge. As part of this work, I joined health department officials for an 11-month information gathering tour. Through listening sessions, group meetings, and targeted focus groups, we spoke with health experts and researchers, practicing clinicians, community service providers, faith leaders, educators, family members, and people with lived experience dealing with mental health challenges. We also met with council leaders and members who provided valuable insight and guidance. These conversations help identify critical mental health needs and gaps in the city's behavioral health services. We heard from immigrants and people of color about their struggles to find culturally competent clinicians. We heard from educators who see how trauma prevents children in their classrooms from learning. We heard from faith leaders and social service providers in low-income neighborhoods who saw the need in their communities but lacked the tools and resources to help. We heard about the lack of, afford of affordability and accessibility of mental health services, and we heard from nearly everyone we talked to about the overwhelming stigma. There are no quick fixes or one-size-fits-all solutions for these tremendous and complex challenges. Thrive NYC is working to remove the barriers to care, so many people identified in those early listening sessions. We are working to close the treatment gaps that prevent New Yorkers from getting the care they need when they need it. And we are investing in prevention efforts and upstream solutions. If we wait to act until people are in crisis, we will always have people in crisis. Just over three years since its launch, Thrive NYC has made demonstrable progress in its work to overcome stigma, build emotional resilience and wellness, and connect people to care in the places where they live, learn, worship, and work. Today, 15 city agencies share responsibility for the implementation of Thrive-supported interventions, services, and initiatives. Each one is grounded in research and evidence-based best practices. Thrive also partners with more than 400 leading healthcare organizations, community-based nonprofits and service providers, and experts in research and academia. There is a role for every single person, from elected officials to faith leaders to neighbors and family members. As our partners and many of the New Yorkers they serve will tell you, real change is starting to take hold in our city. The stories I hear as I travel across the five boroughs are different than those I heard four years ago. For example, earlier, earlier this month, I met Gary, a senior, husband, father, and longtime resident of what he calls old school Brooklyn. He shared how a Thrive program connected him to a counselor at his local senior center who helped him navigate the emotional distress of undergoing major cardiac surgery. In Queens, at Voces Latinas, one of our Thrive partners, I met Ioani, a Mexican immigrant who escaped an abusive husband. She and her children are moving forward beyond the trauma through therapy, all because Thrive had a presence in their community. I have spoken with so many people from marginalized communities who didn't know how to connect to mental health services until Thrive met them where they were. Like Picasso, who was afraid of mental health counseling after being forced into gay conversion therapy in childhood. At one of our runaway and homeless youth centers, group therapy and peer counselors helped them cope with past trauma and address their anxiety and substance use challenges. Every day, Thrive is changing people's lives for the better. 
That's why so many leading organizations, including the American Psychiatric Association, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, and, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, have honored Thrive programs. And the International City and Urban Regional Collab Collaborative recognized Thrive as an innovative global model. When I meet with mayors of cities across the country, they are eager to learn more about how to adapt Thrive's approach for their own communities. Thrive New York City is leading the way on mental health. Susan Herman, who is responsible for managing Thrive operations and working with our partners to advance Thrive's vision, will share more about the evolution of this work and the progress Thrive is making in our communities. I am extremely confident in her and her excellent team. Thank you again for this opportunity and for the Council's partnership and leadership in fighting stigma, improving access to mental health care, and creating a, a healthier, more resilient city for all New Yorkers. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Public Advocate Williams, and members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Susan Herman, and I am the Senior Advisor to the Mayor and Director, Office of Thrive NYC. First, I want to thank the First Lady. New York is fortunate that she has used her platform to shine a light on this issue. I have spent almost my entire career advocating on behalf of people who are typically forgotten, victims of crime, many of whom experience profound mental health challenges. What I know from that work and the work I am now connected to through Thrive is that if we can build more resilience, mitigate trauma, and address mental health needs, we will have a stronger, safer, and healthier city. The overarching aim of Thrive is to ensure that every New Yorker who needs mental health support has access to it, where and when they need it. With science-based initiatives, we complement the robust network of services provided by Health and Hospitals and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We are not a new mental health system. We address needs that have gone unmet by traditional services, and we pilot innovative strategies. This includes new services for historically underserved populations. We also expand what mental health support looks like, because we know that a wide range of interventions can change the course of people's lives. Thrive is also committed to mental health equity. It is important to recognize that the federal government has designated 21 neighborhoods in our city as mental health care shortage areas. As our programs have launched, we have made sure they include new resources in these neighborhoods. In a short period of time, Thrive has grown from a great idea to a robust collection of evidence-based strategies. I will focus today on our budget, operations, and impact. As reflected in the preliminary financial plan, our programmatic budget for FY20 is $251.8 million. A detailed breakdown has been given to you. The majority of Thrive's funding comes from city tax levy, nearly 90% with some resources coming from state and federal grants or private fundraising. Now the budget of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene reflects over $100 million of Thrive programs. The Department of Homeless Services has over $35 million, and the Department of Education has $29 million. The rest of Thrive's programmatic budget is spread over 10 other agencies and offices. One of our guiding principles is changing culture by reducing the stigma associated with mental illness. When people have a physical health problem, they readily seek help. But too often, when people have a mental health problem, they feel ashamed. They feel alone. This has to change. And one way Thrive is changing culture is through mental health first aid training. In the last three years, we have trained over 52,000 community members and over 48,000 frontline city workers. Because of Thrive, that means over 100,000 New Yorkers are now more comfortable talking about mental health, recognizing signs and symptoms of mental illness, and helping point people in need to relevant services. Thrive is also changing the way city agencies think about mental health. Through Thrive, the city has, for the first time, 
made mental health a cross-agency, citywide priority. Our goal is to change how agencies think about mental health in the context of all their programs, not just Thrive programs. Thrive is also broadening the range of mental health support available to New Yorkers by creating non-traditional forms of care. For example, we transformed LifeNet, the city's former suicide hotline, into NYC Well, which is now the most comprehensive mental health helpline in the country, available to anyone with any level of mental health need. We have made great strides in extending our reach. In its second full year, NYC Well responded to over 250,000 calls, texts, and chats, over 150,000 more than LifeNet had in its last year. Another example of innovation is our home visiting program. Before Thrive, healthcare professionals were visiting low-income new parents in their homes to offer support during what is a stressful time under any circumstances. Now, because of Thrive, healthcare workers are also visiting every new parent living in shelter. The program has served over 3,800 families in shelters since 2015. We are also working to expand access to mental health services for groups of New Yorkers who are particularly vulnerable to mental illness and have been historically underserved. For example, crime victims rarely had immediate access to services in what is often a traumatic and isolating time. Before Thrive, victim advocates were available in just three precincts. And now, as shown on the map behind me, this help is available in all 77 precincts. Every victim of crime now has access to immediate services right in their neighborhoods through the Crime Victim Assistance Program, or CVAP. As of this month, CVAP has helped 110,000 people navigate the emotional, physical, and financial aftermath of crime. In addition, we have added clinicians to each borough's family justice center to treat victims of intimate partner and family violence. We have also focused on runaway and homeless youth. Before Thrive, the Department of Youth and Community Development's youth shelters and drop-in centers, which predominantly serve LGBTQ young people, had few on-site mental health resources. Now clinicians are on-site in all 33 DYCD-funded runaway and homeless youth shelters. In the last three years, these clinicians have helped over 10,000 young people. Behind me is a map of the 147 shelters, those for youth, single adults, and families that because of Thrive now have on-site clinical services they did not have before. We are also very concerned about New Yorkers with serious mental illness. Their needs are complex, and hospitalization often isn't the answer. In the last three years, Thrive has added resources to complement the many services that the city already provides for these individuals, to reach them in more ways and in more places. We have created two new types of mobile teams, co-response teams and intensive mobile treatment teams, and expanded to existing teams, assertive community treatment and forensic assertive community treatment teams, which all serve people with serious needs. These teams work to intervene before and stabilize people after a crisis, helping people stay in their communities. They often connect clients to housing and treatment. They also reconnect clients to family members and help with medication if they have stopped taking it. There are currently over 50 mobile teams in the city with the capacity to serve over 3,500 people at any given time. As I noted earlier, we are striving for equity with Thrive and have paid particular attention to increasing access in mental health care shortage areas. The map behind me shows all of the new clinical sites we have added to neighborhoods across the city. This includes 10 different Thrive programs. Collectively, approximately 75% of all new clinical sites are in these mental health care shortage areas. For example, before Thrive, a fraction of the city's public schools, just 195, had a clinician on site, a dedicated clinician on site. As you can see on the map behind me, 
through Thrive, another 173 public schools, mostly high-need schools, now also have a clinician on site. Approximately 80% of these new clinicians are in mental health care shortage areas. Because of Thrive, over 900 more schools have off-site clinical care in place. And through Thrive, every pre-K site in the city has access to clinicians. Another example focuses on older adults who often feel isolated and suffer in silence. Before Thrive, the Department of the Aging did not fund on-site mental health clinicians in any of its senior centers. We now have on-site clinicians offering both screening and treatment in 25 DIFTA-supported senior centers. Those clinicians have treated over 700 people struggling with depression or anxiety. We will expand this program to up to 25 more centers this year. These are just a few of Thrive's initiatives. Behind me is a map of the full range of new Thrive services, including those serving aging New Yorkers, crime victims, new and expecting mothers, individuals at risk of substance misuse, children and young people, and underserved neighborhoods. Together, these Thrive initiatives have pushed mental health support throughout our city, where it has never been before. As we move forward, we are committed to ensuring effectiveness and sustainability. And as with any bold new initiative, we need to look at the right indicators at the right time to help us refine our work. To give some perspective, Thrive initiatives are two and a half to three years old. Many are doing things that have not been done before. In these early years, much of our attention has been focused on implementation and reach. We are now focusing more on refining our outcome measures to assess impact, and we are seeing positive indications. For example, let's look at the co-response teams, staffed by one clinician and two police officers. They've served over 900 people. 95% of their contacts with clients have been successful. What, what that means is leading to many fewer interactions with police and emergency visits to hospitals. These clients are not only mentally ill, but have also demonstrated escalating levels of violent behavior. In our senior centers, clients were screened for mental health disorders. Those who began treatment were screened again three months later. 56% of clients dealing with depression and 65% of seniors suffering from anxiety had improved. For young children exposed to traumatic events identified by ACS, 48% of those engaged in treatment through our early childhood clinics have shown behavioral improvements, a good step towards mitigating early childhood trauma. As we build our program capacity over the next several years, we will continue to partner with researchers to better understand the impact of our work. We are currently evaluating 19 initiatives with more to come, and six more initiatives are already reporting outcome measures. Where appropriate, every Thrive program will have refined its outcome measures. As with other public health strategies, Measuring the population level impact of Thrive will take time. Thrive alone will not address all the factors that contribute to mental illness, such as poverty, violence, homelessness, financial insecurity, racism, and discrimination in all its forms. We also recognize that many other public and private entities are working to improve the mental health of New Yorkers. But with the combined efforts of many, we expect to see improvement in the citywide well-being index, less hopelessness among young people, less suicidality in general, and an increase in the number of people, both children and adults, with mental health disorders who are connected to care. We also expect to see a change in our culture. It is critically important that we eliminate all barriers, including stigma, that prevent people from getting the help they need. We will continue to engage with researchers to help us measure the variety of population level outcomes we can associate with Thrive. Mental health is everyone's responsibility, and I look forward to continuing to work with all members of the City Council 
to advance this important work. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, uh, First Lady McRae and uh, Director Herman as well. Uh, let me begin by talking a little bit about Thrive New York City criteria. Uh, before I begin, let me say we were also joined by Council Member Moya and Council Member Grudenchik, and I think I got everybody else. Okay, um, the city has many mental health initiatives and programs, some of which are branded as Thrive programs and some of which are not. What criteria does the administration use to determine which are Thrive programs and which are not? I'd like to uh, explain that in the, in the beginning, our goal and our goal now is to create a comprehensive approach to mental health care in New York City. And that involved filling some strategic gaps in already existing programs and trying out piloting new innovative strategies. So when you look at the roadmap, which was the initial statement about Thrive, what you see are programs that we thought were particularly important to mention when someone is thinking about what a comprehensive approach means. So these programs span the lifetime of a, pers of a person, they approach particularly vulnerable populations, and it reflects a cross-agency approach. But you've labeled some of them thrive and others not, so what, did, what criteria do you use some of the ones that were in the initial roadmap, for instance, supportive housing, is something that we consider very much an important part of a comprehensive approach to mental health care in the city. But it was up, it was running, it was administered and, and fully embedded in other agencies, and so it's not managed by the Thrive Office. Others, even though they were launched perhaps a couple of months before, before Thrive was announced, are overseen by the Thrive Office. So those that were previously up and running are not included in Thrive, and then the newer ones are with Thrive? Some that were launched immediately prior to Thrive are still in the Thrive. Like CIT training, for instance, was pretty close in timing to when the Thrive Office first opened or the Thrive Initiative first began. So that's included in Thrive. But others that were kind of, first of all, the entire approach of the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, they do much more than Thrive does. Every one of their programs is not in Thrive. Mm -hmm. It's programs that were filling particular gaps in the traditional system and programs that were particularly innovative. The vast majority of the Thrive programs launched when Thrive launched. So were there ever any Thrive programs that were removed from the program? So there are a couple of programs that were time limited and ended. The peer training met and, and surpassed its goal, its goal at the time. That program was ended. And a, a digital platform program that we had with CUNY ended always intended to be time limited. We got what we wanted out of it was to sort of experiment with different ways of reaching students, and that ended. And now you see reflected in the preliminary budget that there's some reallocation of funding, and I'm going to ask David Greenberg from OMB to talk about that. Yes, as Susan mentioned, in the preliminary budget, you see some of these adjustments to the Thrive budget, where there was a, a phase out of a couple of programs and the launch of a, a few new programs and enhancements to some that we were already doing. Can you provide us with a list of all the programs and initiatives that have ever been included under the Thrive umbrella, uh, with the dates that they were branded as such? I think you, you have a detailed budget um, attached to the testimony, or it was included. And so even within that budget, you see some that have been, that are no cost items, some that have been zeroed out, meaning they've ended. And this is it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's talk Those a little- Those are for budgeted items. There are a few no cost items that are not there. Can you get us a list of those? The no-cost items? Yeah. Yes, of course. The council has asked for a list of all the budget codes for Thrive NYC programs. What are the OMB budget codes for Thrive NYC and other uh, Thrive Mental Health First Aid, Thrive Mental Health Service Corps, and Thrive NYC Well, uh, uh, well Call Center? I'm going to ask David Greenberg to okay. take that. 
Yes, Council Member. So on the issue of budget codes, where possible, we did create new budget codes for Thrive. Those are largely in areas that are brand new programs or the entirety of the program is Thrive. Um, and for those, we're happy to provide you a list of those. Um, the complexity with budget codes is that a lot of Thrive programs are enhancements to services where we have contracts registered against existing budget codes. For example, in a DIFTA Senior Center, we're now augmenting those services to provide mental health. And we can't really isolate those expenditures from the budget code without um, possibly creating a, a disruption of payments to these non-for-profits. But happy to get back to um, your council finance staff on the list of budget codes. And when, when can we expect that list? Uh, we can provide that as soon as we're done with this hearing. Okay, very good. Um, can there be a clarification and consistency on program names within the budget to allow for the completion of a crosswalk of all funding dedicated to Thrive NYC? I'd like to ask David to take that. I think it's, it's important to realize that the management of Thrive programs actually rests with agencies. They own the programs, they run them. We are overseeing them, making sure that they are um, doing what they said they were going to do, that they're maximizing their efficiency, and we're working towards sustainability. But I'm gonna ask David to talk Just about that Just on that, that note, point. when I was attending an aging committee hearing, uh, the uh, commissioner at that time said she did not know what the infusion of, I think it was $1.7 million into her budget was going to be used for. I'm, I'm surprised to hear that, but I'm happy to say that the money that's going, the new money that's going to DIFTA is going to be supporting 25 new senior centers, uh, more than the 25 than we have now. And that's been clearly um, told to her? Uh, yes, she helped announce it. Okay. Thank you. And I just want to add to follow up on your question. We're committed to providing the information you need for tracking Thrive, and we will talk with your staff afterwards. Is there a um, delineation between new funding and existing funding for Thrive initiatives? Again, I'm going to ask David to explain that. So the vast majority of Thrive's $250 million annual program budget is new funding. All but 12.6 million of that um, is new. So when we launched Thrive and announced it, uh, the majority of those funds were then added into the budget for those programs. Can I also clarify something? It's very, uh, I'm sure that the DIFTA commissioner understands that the money is going to 25 new senior centers. It's very possible that she misunderstood the question because she doesn't yet know which senior centers are going to be selected. So she may have been responding in that way to say, I'm not sure where that money is going to go. And that's, that is true. She'll have to go through a careful process. And from, what, from my notes here, it said that she did not uh, have a plan about how the money would be spent, including which senior centers would receive the money, whether it would go to the existing centers or fund services at new centers, or how it would alter the distribution of services by borough. Well, that is true. She doesn't yet know which senior centers will either stand up new services, which ones will augment existing services, or where they will be. That is true. She has to go through a, a careful selection process. When can we There's expect lots that? Of criteria that has to be established, or when, that is established. When can we expect that? I'm sure she'll do this as soon as she can, the, and the, the money will flow in the, next, at, in the next fiscal year. How much of the $251.8 million fiscal 2020 budget represents new funding, and how much was uh, funding that existed before Thrive, but has since been rebranded re as Thrive? Similarly, can you provide a breakdown from the last three years about what funding was new and what funding was existing when, tr when Thrive began? We have ch charted all that out, and I'm going to ask David again to take that. So yes, council member, of the 250.9, 237 is new funding. And can we get a, uh, a breakdown on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Of the 250.9 million budgeted uh, for fiscal 19 and 251 million budgeted for fiscal 2020, how much is city funds and how much is from other sources? 
I think in your testimony, uh, Director um, Herman, you mentioned 90% of city funds. Mm -hmm. uh, what, where does the other funding come from? I'd like to ask David to spell that out. So, sorry. Uh, 26.3 million of the 250 is non-city funds, and that's a combination of federal and state grants and some private fundraising. Okay, what is the headcount associated with Thrive? And how many budgeted positions does Thrive uh, support in fiscal 19 and 20? David? Yes, so the city funded headcount for Thrive programs is 580. And, and just for context, the, of the entire Thrive budget, about 20% of it is PS. How many CVO staff does Thrive support? So the, that level of detail is not really something that we monitor. When it comes to our contracted vendors, we're looking at performance and, and the amount of money that's being spent, but not the day-to-day -day of their staffing patterns. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about the Office of Thrive, uh, which was created earlier this year, and according to the press release, its role will be to oversee the continued integration of Thrive's programs throughout city agencies. Can you describe a little more broadly what the role of the office will be? Well, the role of the office is to take us into the next chapter of Thrive, which is to focus primarily on sustainability, maximizing efficiency, and really making sure that every agency in New York City is promoting mental health to the extent that they can. So we're working across agencies regularly. We're engaging them. Uh, they are managing their programs. We're making sure that they're at full capacity. And um, <clears throat> who is responsible for making um, programming decisions, policy decisions, and, and budgeting decisions? Susan. Susan Herman is responsible for day-to-day -day management of Thrive. For all of that, and, and I would imagine she's ultimately accountable for Thrive. That's right. Okay. Who is a single point of contact for overseeing Thrive's budget? The, the oversight of the budget is really an OMB responsibility. Um, we are watching it. We are working with agencies on whether they are implementing the programs the way they said they would and the way they should be. The management of the budget is really an OMB responsibility. And I just want to add that the day-to-day -day management, because Thrive's $250 million budget is embedded within city agencies, that function is really lives within those agencies. Um, let me go back to uh, DIFTA again. Did DIFTA ask for the funding, or did someone at Thrive decide that they should receive it? That was a conversation back and forth. It was a program that was clearly successful, clearly doing well. They were happy to expand it, and we were happy to give them that opportunity. Okay. What about when schools? <laughs> Last Friday, the school's chancellor tweeted that for the first time, mental health services are available to every single New York City school, connecting families and staff to uh, usually important resources that support the social and emotional needs of students. Can you explain uh, what this means and by what measure are mental health services available in every school? Well, for the first time, we have some kind of mental health support in all 1,800 of our schools. Now, the support is not the same in every school. As you know, our schools have uh, vastly different needs. Uh, some of our schools are very small, some are very large. Uh, when we started out, uh, you know, it was my hope that we could do more right away, but we didn't have the data, we didn't have the um, information that we needed to just pour money into it. So right now, we have, um, some of our schools have, have health clinics, they have clinics within them, some have clinics that work within the neighborhood. Uh, all of our pre-K teachers have been trained in social emotional learning. Uh, we can get you the exact breakout of, of you know, where the services are, but um, there is something everywhere, and it's something that uh, we would, you know, we certainly would like to do more with. Something that um, 
I've been working on ever since I was a chair of the education committee is trying to get more guidance counselors into our public school system. So there are over 200 schools without a full-time guidance counselor and over 700 schools without a full-time social worker. Uh, from a mental health perspective, is this good policy? And what is Thrive doing to increase the number of guidance counselors and social workers in schools? We're looking at it very carefully. Um, we know that the need is there and it's urgent. We know that, uh, well, act early is, is, is one of our principles. Uh, so we are, um, I would say that it is something that we're looking at. I'm not ready to, to talk about it right now, but we will have more to say soon. Susan, right. do you want to yeah, add to what, that? What I can say is just, just to repeat a little bit of what I said in my testimony, sorry. We know that there's an urgent need in schools, and the statement that the chancellor made is really worth underscoring. We're, we're seeing um, students talking about attempting suicide. We're seeing students talking about feeling helpless. We have poured clinicians into our schools so that we now have many, many more on-site clinicians, and in addition, every other school in the city now has access to mental health clinicians actual dedicated clinicians. And every pre-K site has actual clinicians that they can connect to. So hundreds more have on-site, and every other school in the city has clinicians they can connect to. That's a major achievement. However, in the uh, preliminary budget, the mayor did not provide funding for bridging the gap for social workers for those who have high populations of homeless students. How do we explain that? I, I think we're really talking about different things. We're talking about clinicians who are offering mental health support to students. Well, social workers are offering Social workers are indeed important, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny well. that there's a need for that. What, what I'm focusing on today is what Thrive has supported, and that's critical mental health support to all of our schools. And what does that mental health support look like in the schools? What does the clinician do? The clinician not only offers direct support to students, meaning counseling and support, but also trains other staff in the school how to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health conditions, how to respond more appropriately, and how to refer people to um, support treatment when necessary. Are they this working with the homeless students? Uh, they're working with everybody that's in school, of course. Okay. Of course. Well, it's just disappointing to see that money taken out of the budget when it also provides additional mental health services. So, so we are working with all students in every single school. Clinical care is available to everybody, whether they're in school, or whether they are, whether they get it on site, or whether they get it off site. It's available to everyone. We're also doing a tremendous amount of work in our shelters, both for all of our shelters that, that um, all of the mental health, <laughs> sorry, every child that's in shelter has mental health support with linkages in that shelter. So there are separate mental health linkages provided to children who are in shelters. But we have also placed clinicians in our family shelters, in our adult single shelters, and in our runaway and youth shelters. They have clinicians okay. there. All right, well, I'm still going to be looking very closely to see if that is put into the executive budget uh, as we move forward. That Bridging the Gap program is very important, very important to mental health services in the school, and they are not just supplemental, but they're very necessary as well. We agree with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in fiscal 2016, 17, and 18, actual spending for Thrive was dramatically less than budgeted funding. Uh, were these budget surpluses included as part of the citywide savings plan in the past three years? I'm going to ask David Greenberg to mm -hmm. respond to that. So if your question is about um, previous spending against budget in Thrive, uh, I just want to point out that during those years it was a ramp up period um, where expenditures uh, gradually grew over time. Um, at the end of the year when we reconcile, uh, at the agency, I'll remember these funds live within an agency. Um, you know, whatever, there's surpluses and there's deficits and it nets out at the end, and so those uh, just ended up in the close as some kind of uh, surplus to the agency. 
Will these surpluses include part of the uh, citywide plan, savings plan, or will they be moving forward? So moving forward, uh, we anticipate now that the program, the Thrive program is all up and running, that they should be running at budget. Uh, so going forward, we don't anticipate, but again, we're constantly assessing the needs of Thrive, uh, along with other city programs and the resources that are necessary to, to, to um, perform. And so I think what you just saw in the preliminary budget was an example of that kind of exercise that, that may continue going forward as we continue this process. And um, is um, Thrive going to be affected by the $750 million peg? So right now agencies are working on their our PEG programs and uh, Thrive is not exempt. Um, so if there's an opportunity for an agency to do a program, including a Thrive or a non-Thrive program in a, a more cost-effective way, then that's something that we're willing to look at and we're going through that process right now. Okay, <clears throat> in the New York Times, um, uh, on an article on Thrive this weekend, the reporter referenced uh, a spreadsheet of nearly 500 data points that are tracked by City Hall, noting that almost none of them relate to patient outcomes. Can that spreadsheet be provided to the council as well, including the data that has been tracked? We're committed to giving you all the information that you need um, and happy to do that afterwards. Okay, thank you. I just wanna talk before I turn it over to uh, my colleagues for questions about the seriously mentally ill. Uh, how much of Thrive's budget is spent on people with serious mental illnesses and do you believe it's a sufficient amount? All of Thrive is really focused on the seriously mentally ill. Um, it's one of the reasons why Thrive was launched. As you know, mental illness is a disease or they are diseases um, and can worsen over time if they're not treated. Uh, Thrive is dedicated to prevention when possible, at early intervention, um, at treating people in crisis, and making sure that people are stabilized if they do reach a crisis. People do not end up in crisis overnight. It's, it's a process, and uh, too often people have not gotten the kind of services that they need. So Thrive has expanded and improved services for people with serious mental illness. We have more than 50 mobile teams that can provide preventive or ongoing treatment in, community, in communities for the people who have these serious needs. Um, our teams have the capacity to treat um, more than 3,000 people. Uh, Thrive has expanded the existing teams and added two new models. Um, to make sure that people are getting the most effective treatment available. Susan, would you like to add to that? Just to say that our work, it's very important that, that we realize that Thrive is not a, a new mental health system. We are complementing the work, that's, the good work that's being done by health and hospitals and the Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. We are, we are filling strategic gaps and piloting innovative programs. For the seriously mentally ill, to be able to work with people so that they can stay in community by connecting them to services, by helping them connect or reconnect to treatment, we're helping people both before crisis and after crisis. One of my concerns and one of the concerns of the council is the number of mentally ill people that are on Rikers Island, about 43% of those people, and many of them seriously mentally ill mentally ill. Um, at the um, Department of Corrections preliminary budget hearing, uh, the commissioner stated that Thrive does not work in the facilities. Um, how do you respond to that? So, you know, in the, in the early years, what Thrive focused on was implementation and reach. Reaching people all over the city, places where they hadn't been reached and populations that hadn't been released, uh, that hadn't been reached. For, for many reasons, Thrive didn't focus on branding Thrive. We got programs up and running and they were called NYC Well. They were called the Crime Victim Assistance Program. They were called CIT. They were called Mental Health First Aid. They weren't called Thrive Mental Health First Aid or Thrive This or Thrive Crime Victim Assistance Program. I'm sure most of you know about the CVAP program. You may not know that it's Thrive. The focus was on reach, reach, reach. We are on Rikers Island. We've trained over 700 uniformed corrections officers in CIT training. We 
and we provide a, a art therapy program for the young adults there. We have moved that work to Horizons. We are there. And I'm sure the Corrections Commissioner knows that, that her officers are CIT trained. She may not necessarily associate it with Thrive. Okay. Those officers have also embraced uh, mental health first aid training and want to do more. Um, but again, they probably don't think of it as a Thrive program. And, and, and even with my question about the um, Commissioner for Aging, mm -hmm. if they're not aware th or that it's a Thrive program, you have to understand how confusing it is to us and to the public as well. So I would just suggest that you make sure that those commissioners are aware when they come in for the executive budget hearing, what is Thrive and what isn't Thrive, because we're going to follow up at that time about the program as well. Yes? That is, that is a very important part of our mission going forward, okay. now that most of our programs are, are being implemented. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just want to announce that we've been joined by Council Members Cohen, Torres, Cumbo, and Traeger, and we're now going to have questions from Chair Ayala, followed by Public Advocate Williams. Thank you. I'll try to keep it quick because I know that we have a lot of members here that have questions, but <clears throat> my question is really uh, re regarding the closing the treatment gap. And, you know, I've in many hearings uh, shared, uh, you know, circumstances that were very personal to me and having to take someone to the emergency psych unit um, for what I thought was uh, an in inpatient, a person that needed inpatient treatment and realized immediately after getting there that there's like an entire process that was very foreign to me and that I'm sure is very foreign to most New Yorkers. And that is that if you uh, take a person who has been presenting symptoms of, of psychosis or maybe have uh, uh, the propensity to become violent, at the moment that they see that doctor, if they're calm and relaxed, they could have just been having you know, a, a mental breakdown an hour before, but at the moment that they're making contact with that doctor, that doctor makes an immediate assessment as to whether or not that person at that moment is a threat to themselves or to anyone else in the public. And most often, even against uh, some doctor's orders, these individuals are, are released you know, onto the street. And so I wonder, I don't, I don't think that that is a thrive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame this on, you know, a, a deficiency in the thrive model, but I wonder, um, as we're bringing more and more awareness to, you know, mental illness, what is the, how, how is, how can thrive work? to close that treatment gap? How are we better advocating, is, be it with the state, be it with um, you know, whatever entity would be responsible for this, right? To ensure that, that patients are not being released solely on that first three minutes of interaction. There is no communication with family members, there's no, no input. Like I, as a, as a person who was witnessing the breakdown, could not share because this individual has rights. Uh, so I wonder what, you know, what, if anything, what conversations have you, have you been having? I, I share your frustration, um, and it's, it's very painful to not be able to uh, communicate uh, with the, the doctors in a, in a way that to help your loved one or your family member. I, we have to do more. I think that this is a, a good uh, topic for us to take up. Uh, and, and see what we can do, do to uh, make sure that there is more communication and more coordination um, be, between systems of care. Yeah, Susan, I, would you like to? Add? I just wanted to, to, to share that. Uh, my, the the uh, presenting uh, physician at Metropolitan Hospital, who's great, uh, said to me, you know, oftentimes we would advise against a person's discharge and if we, you know, if we have to hold them, they have a courthouse, right? Which many of us, I had no idea there was a courthouse in the hospital, right? And they're given a, a manual, which they, the patient can read to better educate themselves on how to get themselves released from the psych unit. And then they will go before the judge and they would, they would present their case. And again, oftentimes against doctor's orders, these individuals are released on the street. And I wonder, is that contributing to what we're seeing? Um, and are we measuring that? Is anybody really paying close attention to that? It's a very serious problem to think about who is getting, and it's the right question to ask, are people getting the right responses? Is everybody getting what they need? It's also a state 
law yeah. that whatever that criteria is, dangerous to themselves or others, this is a state law. It's a serious and big decision to commit someone involuntarily. That's why there's all that process. But we are looking to make sure, to be as comprehensive as possible, we are looking to make sure that we can communicate and reach people sometimes right after that and sometimes right before that. That's the work of these mobile teams that we're talking about. That's what we're so excited about, that Thrive has added new teams, new capacity to see people right away, and also to, um, we've added to teams that pre-existed. We have more options now than an emergency room than we had before. We're trying to add more and more every day. These mobile teams are keeping people in communities. The diversion centers that you'll see by the end of this year give police and others another tool, another option. That's what we're trying to do, to have people treated where they need it, when they need it, rather than always thinking the emergency room is the answer. Because sometimes you can, you can look back and say, had you intervened earlier, you might not have needed to get to that point. I, I don't want to let the state off the hook here, however, because I think that you know there has to I be a conversation. Either. And you know, as they continue to close more and more psychiatric beds, you know, there, there has to be a conversation because there has to be some collateral consequence to the city if we're not measuring, you know, or, or following these individuals as we're integrating them into, you know, society. Mm -hmm. Agree. Thank you. Thank you, Agree. Susan. Mr. Public Advocate. Thank you. Uh, and thanks again. I, I just want to get a couple of things clear. So, um, firstly, just for clarity, um, you kind of provide the vision of Thrive NYC, and Susan, you run the day-to-day -day operations. Is that correct? That's correct. That, that's correct. Thrive NYC was my idea. I'm the founder. I provide strategic support. I hold convenings on behavioral health, and I amplify messages to the public. Susan Herman um, does the day-to-day -day management and, and makes the decisions. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, from, the, from the budget I see here, from the past three years, it was $595 million spent so far, if I'm not correct. And it, it, how, if I'm correct, how much of that, again, you're saying 90% of that was new money that was put in, not old money repurposed, is that correct? That's correct. I just want to clarify, we were projecting about 565 um, between FY16 to 19. Um, but yes, uh, the majority of that money that is in the Thrive budget of the 250, all but 12.6 of it um, uh, is new. All right, and if I can understand, based on what I saw and what I heard so far, I kind of broke it down to two areas. One is, I guess, some kind of coordination of existing programs, and the rest is an infusion of new programs and the terms that we use are science-based initiatives and evidence-based strategies. Is that correct? That's correct. How much money is spent in each? I, I like to just step back a little and say that, that much of what Thrive does falls into several of those categories. So we have, I would say, money that we have put into existing services to fill gaps in the traditional system and then particular strategies that we're piloting that are brand new. But the vast majority of what Thrive is doing, the vast majority of where the money has been spent, are on new programs. They're not, they're not supplanting budget items that were there before. So most of it is on uh, new programs, less on the coordination and less on the gaps, but, but new initiatives. Well, before. the gaps are, are also new programs. We are filling gaps with new programs. In other words, right now, you have a single point of access to the full so, range of programs. So, but it's still two categories. It's one coordination and one infusion of new programs, whether they're gaps of new programs or new programs. I'm not sure if the, the language is adequate to explain what okay. we're doing. Um, we have an enhanced programs. For example, our family justice centers, before they had no um, counseling services for the survivors. So we have and we've put an infusion of money to make sure that they have counseling and a psychiatrist and all of so that's that's additional money, so but I, it's not a new program really. So I would say new programs slash filling gaps of existing programs. Mm -hmm. So those are still in my thing two 
areas. One is coordination of, of existing programs, I think. You can tell me if I'm wrong. And then okay. infusion of new programs slash gaps of old programs. I, I wouldn't say coordination. I think that, to me, coordination is the existence of NYC Well, which provides a central point of access where anyone can, can, can call, text, online, and, and find any service that is available in the city to address their need. That's coordination. Um, coordination is also um, the collaborative work between agencies, I don't, but I don't, it's not, but in and of itself, it's not a, a program. I, I don't disagree with that. I assumed it costs money to do those. I was just trying to figure out how much money each one of those buckets are being spent. Well, if we can break down what each of the initiatives costs for you, if you'd like, and that's, that's in the budget that's okay. in front of you. Each one of the initiatives has a price tag. Okay. And we can um, put them in those categories, if you'd like. We can work on that. Um, I, uh, with the, the EDP task force that the mayor originally didn't want to do, and the city council pushed, um, where are we with that? Is Thrive coordinating with uh, uh, the task force? It was supposed to have a report out. Um, Ms. Herman, you're a member of the task force as well as I believe some of us are. I'm not sure. They met a couple of times. Are you coordinating with the task force? Do we know when it's coming out? So I'm one of the co-chairs with Dr. Belkin, who's here. And it was a very lengthy and um, serious <laughs> process with many council members participating. Over 75 people from New York City uh, participated in the task force. There were committees, subcommittees. The recommendations are now under review, and Thrive will be coordinating with them. All right. Well, it's late, so hopefully it will come out soon. I think it encompasses a lot of what you're saying here, trying to uh, get in front of the issue before yeah, police Yeah, it was order. ultimately called the Crisis Prevention and Response Task Force to do exactly what you're talking about, to, okay. to try and avert crises as much as possible, um, to handle a crisis appropriately, and stabilize people afterwards as well as possible. So I'll just end with this one. I, again, uh, my hope is, you know, in additional questions, I, I did want to get a better understanding of what was being used just for acute mental health illness and what was being used for just mental health for the rest of us. I think that's an important discussion. And also, I, from what I'm hearing, I, I think it's a, a great program, but I do feel some of the metrics and concerns are being back-ended. I think we started spending money before we had a discussion about how we gauge this. And, and I don't know if that's a necessarily a horrible thing if, if things are getting done, but I, I think there should have been more discussion about how we were gonna gauge this moving forward and hopefully from this point on, we will do the better job of that because this is an incredible amount of money being spent. And I think the public has a right to ask these specific questions, um, but I do think it is a, a worthwhile initiative and, and I'm thankful that the uh, First Lady has taken it upon herself to, to do this. There's, I think there's a lot of questions that I still think needs to be answered, but my, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the need is, is, is without question and, and we've really appreciated working with all the council members and, and uh, elected officials to, to get this up and running. It is not true that we didn't have metrics in mind before we launched Thrive. It was part of our, our initial conversations. Remember, we took 11 months um, just having conversations with people before the launch of Thrive. We went to every borough. We talked to clinicians, uh, parents, people with lived experience. We've convened with local and national experts on this. Uh, so it's been a very thoughtful rollout but um, it's kind of a work in process um, that we can't do everything, we haven't been able to do everything at once. Susan, I think do I you want to clarify? I would just say, I think that all of that is probably true and thoughtful, and that probably helped put out the program, but I don't know if it helped shape how we were gonna decide whether the program was successful. And I think we're doing some of that now. Yeah, I, I think that you know, as we move forward, we will be working together to determine you know, where our, our um, greatest successes are and, and how we want to shape Thrive going forward. This is, no one's ever done this before. And uh, it's a citywide uh, approach. So we, we all have to be part of, of making this what we need it to be for the people that we serve. Um, and we value your contributions. To the extent that I can be helpful, I'd love to move forward with you. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer, followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you very much. So I think very few, if any, people would say that we're spending too much on mental health. That includes myself, uh, someone who experienced uh, significant depression as a gay teen, uh, closeted gay teen in high school. I think where there are legitimate questions and concerns is about management outcomes and, and uh, supervision. So from what I gather, and I think you said this, uh, Director Herman, that the management of Thrive essentially rests with the agencies where this funding has been allocated to. And uh, generally speaking, commissioners uh, report to deputy mayors, and of course all of you uh, who work for the city of New York report to the mayor. But in the case of this funding, you're roughly the quarterback of this team, uh, to use an overused analogy. But I guess my question is, one of the things that I think happens with uh, direct reports and, and supervision is if an agency is overseeing a program and it's not going well, there's a deputy mayor then who's able to say, that's a significant problem, I'm not happy with that, that needs to be corrected. Do you have that authority though as the director and overseer of Thrive NYC uh, because you're not the direct report of commissioners, right? So. DOHMH and these 15 agencies that you have out here. So if they're experiencing a problem that you identify, do you have the ability then, and are they reporting to you on the Thrive-specific uh, programs that are existing and being funded in their agencies? I think it's very important to note that the Office of Thrive NYC, when it was established, was created to report to the first deputy mayor. So part of my oversight role requires me to report regularly to the first deputy mayor what's happening in each of these agencies. So I understand, so you report to the first deputy I mayor. I do. But there's several hundred million dollars dispersed throughout all these agencies and you are watching the programs that are Thrive specific within those agencies I trust, right? And, and so, and I think this is sort of the, one of the fundamental questions is, uh, if we are uh, making sure that we're getting the, the return on the tax dollar investment here, um, then there's got to be accountability, right? And, and is that accountability coming from yourself as the director who's sort of uh, working in collaboration with the commissioners? Um, what if you see something that isn't working and, and, and you're talking with the commissioner about that. Obviously, you're reporting to the first deputy mayor. They, too, are reporting, I assume, to a, a deputy, deputy mayor. Uh, maybe it's the same one, maybe it's not, right, depending on which agency. So where's the, the accountability there with respect to you and your relationship with the commissioners, the deputy mayors? How is that? Because I understand that the management of Thrive rests with the agencies and their commissioners who are overseeing these programs, some of which are very large. You're the, the quarterback of the team, roughly. Um, and then where's the accountability with respect to you, the commissioner, and the deputy mayors? How does that work out, particularly if something is if something working great, then we're all happy to uh, celebrate that. But if it's not, how do you intervene directly with a, a commissioner vis-a-vis -a, -vis a deputy mayor? Because they're not reporting to you, they're reporting to a deputy mayor. Uh, Susan Harmon is responsible for the the day-to-day -day management of, of Thrive, all of the programs, and, and I think it's important to note that she was the first ever deputy commissioner for collaborative policing, which worked with agencies all across seated government. And it is a, a mission that is very similar to, to Thrive. We need agency ownership, we need agencies to be responsible, to be effective and sustainable. Um, and that being said, um, first deputy mayor Fullahan oversees many agencies that are responsible for Thrive Program. So, so he is, um, it is a collaborative effort by nature um, that is necessary in order to reach as many people as we are reaching. Uh, First Deputy uh, Mayor Fullahan is also responsible for making sure that there is overall effectiveness and sustainability of all city government and works very closely with the deputy mayors. So there's a lot of communication going on. Um, a lot of communication, but of course accountability lies with Susan Herman. And I have great respect for Director Herman and uh, she's uh, 
uh, displaying a great deal of competence and, uh, uh, and strength here at this hearing. But I also uh, need to ask the questions, and I know my time is up, so I just want to leave you with a couple of questions that have come to us. At the Queensborough delegation hearing, uh, there were uh, a couple of Asian American uh, CBOs who talked about not having been uh, worked with or outreached to, and I'm I wonder, sorry, did you say Haitian or Asian? Asian American, American. Uh, uh, community-based organizations. Uh, I know the Asian American Federation mm -hmm. is, is one group that has spoken about this issue. Maybe you can uh, address that issue uh, of a, that particular organization or community feeling overlooked in the process. Uh, and then maybe the turnover of, of your mental health service cores as well, and I'll, I'll end it there for this round. Well, I'd like to say that we, we work with all of our community partners, and we have more than 400 community-based organizations that we're working with to do outreach and trainings and events, and um, that includes the Punjabi Sikh, the Bengali, Chinese, Korean, and, and broader Asian American communities. Uh, we are always thinking about how we can enhance these programs. We cannot be successful unless everyone is involved. That is why we have a... Brothers Sisters Thrive program. That is why we have a Latinx program. That is why we're working with our, our, our immigrants, um, high, serving high need populations, as you can see from our, our map, is, is a priority for us. Um, our outreach works with other city teams as well as elected officials, and, and, um, and we welcome um, anyone who wants to be part of this, um, and we encourage everyone to be part of this because, it's, as I said in my testimony, that, that we all have to be part of the solution of making sure that people are educated about mental health, that they actually have an understanding of this, these diseases and know how to access services. Susan, would you like to add? Sure, I would just add that we have several long-term partnerships with several Asian organizations where we've sponsored events, we've taught mental health first aid, classes in different languages, including we regularly teach mental health first aid in Mandarin. It can be taught in Korean upon request. And we are working with many organizations. I, I am going, I have reached out to the Asian Federation. I will be meeting with them, but we have an ongoing relationship with several Asian organizations and, and include them and welcome more. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to remind my colleagues also to please stick by the two-minute time limit. Uh, we have another hearing immediately following this. We're actually behind schedule here. So I'd like to uh, now turn the mic over to Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Powers. Thank you so much. Um, I want to start by thanking you from shifting the city's outlook on mental health from siloed agencies to a comprehensive, comprehensive vision about mental health. Um, you're uncovering all these things, all these gaps, and trying to, to fill those. Um, spot on, kudos, thank you for thinking about it that way. I really appreciate it. Um, I am concerned uh, about a couple things. One is I hope we can use this as an opportunity to shine a spotlight on the deficiencies of the procurement process. So to the extent the city is not providing the service directly but contracting out, you will see that the procurement process itself is hideous. That number one, we don't pay our service providers enough money and so they're being asked to do all the beautiful things that you're articulating with three quarters of the finances they need. And number two, they're not actually paid until six months, a year, a year and a half after services have begun. And although we are implementing Passport to address that, we just had a hearing on it, we uncovered, unveiled lots of problems. So number one, that. Number two, um, I would encourage you, uh, OMB, to not subject Thrive to the hiring freeze. We've heard about all these great things. It will only cripple the program. I don't know how you can. Uh, report on successes and still be subject to a hiring freeze. And lastly, um, I'm concerned that some of these great ideas 
um, have been great ideas for a really long time. And on the council, we have seen that they've not been funded and therefore have created city council initiatives to fill the gap. Here's an example uh, from something that uh, Director Herman mentioned. Um, on-site clinicians in schools, it's great you're doing that. A, don't do any off-site stuff. You can't claim victory if you're referring stuff out. You can't claim that you have somebody on-site who's noticing behavior in the classroom or culture of a school that can only be done on site. And I would argue that's true for our schools and for our homeless shelters or even supportive service shelters. We are always finding deficiencies in those contracts by contracting out off site provision of whether it be a social worker, a clinical mental health provider, a guidance counselor, I don't care what it is. But that is a gnawing um, um, deficiency in all of these services, specifically at PS191 when we rezoned in order to integrate the schools. Council the Member, can you get to the question? Yes, the largest problem was getting a guidance counselor in the school. We don't need a clinical mental health provider. We need on-site counseling. I've been funding for the past five years a program called Counseling in the School. I funded them to the extent with the, my discretionary funds so that they have an on-site counselor. And that indeed is what has allowed the school to improve functioning as we desegregate our schools. Those are my general thoughts. Thank you very much. I, I acknowledge that this is of critical importance and look forward to working with you on this going forward. Thank you. Councilmember Powers, followed by Holden. Yeah. Echo, I had that. Thank uh, I'm, I'm on the two minute drill, so I'm going to go fast. I just asked for quick answers back. Um, there's an Office of the Thrive, I think, too, that I didn't see reflected in the $250 million budget. We did a budget mod in December to approve 13 new jobs. Can you tell us the budget of the Office of the Thrive? Office of Thrive? I'm going to ask David to give you exact figures, David Greenberg. Sure. Yes, Council Member, the Office of Thrive budget is $2 million. $2 million. So that's on top of the, that's a small piece on top of what's here. Today. Yes, the budget you have is the program budget. The Office of Thrive is administrative and outside of it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> is, um, and to the council, following up with the council member Rosendahl's question, is that subject to a hiring freeze like the other agencies have in this fiscal year? So all agencies are subject to the hiring freeze, um, and it's a regular part of our, our conversations with the agencies as we go through that process. Great. Thank you. And, and every agency is asked to do uh, a PEG this year to achieve savings. Um, can you tell us, uh, you answered this, but I just want to get clarity on it. Where does Thrive and the programs here fit into, or the Office of Thrive fit into the PEG? Uh, so as I said earlier, the uh, Thrive programs are not exempt from the PEG, and so right now agencies are uh, working through what their proposals are to, to achieve those savings, and so um, they can propose some efficiencies. With so the, the agencies program. have to do it in the program yes. space. Okay, got it. Um, I've noticed you're over-budgeted every year, so you have 78 billion, you're 78, but you spend 43, 188 budget, 125, 224, 174, now 250, 251, 251 as anticipated spending. Can you talk to us about why you're asking for 250 when it seems like every other, every other year you're coming under budget, which I'm not faulting you. We ask, ask agencies to, to save money where they can, but can you take, give us where 250 when you're, you seem to be under every year? So the, the budget that you have in front of you reflects a ramping up period. Many of the programs that you see particularly underspending in their budget were programs that encountered unexpected difficulties, either, either with the procurement process or with siting issues or, or something programmatic. But at this point, we feel that most of the programs are operating at full scale, and we're very close to spending the budgeted amount for this year, and we will be going forward. 
Okay, I appreciate that answer, thank you. And just the last question, because I know we're on time, but uh, I wanted to make sure, just, I wanted to just talk about metrics for success here. There's been um, some discussion around measuring 400 and something measurements. I think it's totally fine to measure a lot of different things to figure out how you're performing uh, and how this, what large scale of programs, you would need a lot of measurements. I, I'm wondering though, the mayor's management report has, I think it's like probably 10 or 12 different metrics that you have as performance indicators, but can you just tell us at the council, um, yeah, I, I mean, you have mentioned the ramping up your budgets now, I think three or four times where it was when it started. It's a real investment in mental health services. I think the city should be making a, a, an investment in here. But I want to understand if you can tell us what you feel like are your performance indicators that will measure success as we get into the fourth or fifth or sixth fiscal year where we're funding Thrive. It's, it's important to us to make sure that we're measuring everything and then, of course, measuring the right things. Um, but we're talking about people here, not numbers. Um, it's, it is a challenge to measure the relief of anguish and suffering on a spreadsheet. Um, as we have ramped up, we, we have more indications of, of, of how to note the effectiveness of, of, of different programs. But we, what we do know is that we're achieving a much needed cultural and structural change. We're changing the conversation around mental health and mental health is now integrated in, every, in everything that we do across the city. Um, we are working towards uh, more standardized measures. Um, again, we have lots of metrics, but I understand what you're looking for and that is something that takes time to provide. Thank you, Adam. Thank Susan, you. I want to oh, turn to Susan to. I'd like yeah. to just elaborate a little bit about what the First Lady said. Measurement is absolutely important, and it's very important to measure the right things at the right time. I want to make it really clear that these initiatives were initiatives that are based on evidence informed or evidence based practices. So at the outset, we had a sense of if we, if we implement this initiative, this is what is likely to happen. So we started out knowing where we wanted to go with programs. The exercise that we're engaged in now, we have refined implementation measures, we've refined reach measures, which were really important to us at the beginning, how many people are we reaching, and now we are refining outcome measures. I don't think it's fair to say we have no outcome measures. We have some that have already been um, uh, tracked as part of the, the work that agencies are doing. We have external evaluations that are underway. We have significant number of internal evaluations. More to come. But these outcome measures just need to be refined and then they will be part of what agencies are tracking. And, and every, every initiative where it's appropriate, and that's almost all of them, not all, but almost all of them, will have one or two or the appropriate number of outcome measures. I, I just want to be, for the record, I never, I didn't said nothing about there being no performance measures. I think there are. I'm, I was asking from the administration outcome. for Thrive, yeah. which ones you've prioritized as determining success in it. I, I, I read I the mayor's management report and um, and your numbers. I think there's, the no, you see numbers of access going up. I think access is really important. Yep. I think that as we get to, you know, next year, the year after, I think what the council would be interested in is all, in addition, just the access part of it, seeing that there's also results. And I totally agree with you, tracking this on a spreadsheet is not an easy measurement to do, but I think also knowing, in addition to access, out, outcomes that are based on wellness um, would absolutely, also be. Absolutely, absolutely. And some of the measures, let's make a distinction between outcomes of initiatives and population level outcomes. Some of the population level outcomes will take a while, just as any public health initiative does. If you look at the city's trans fat ban in restaurants, if you look at the smoking bans, if you look at population level outcomes, sometimes it takes a long time. But we will know what the outcomes of these initiatives are, and we will be looking at population level impact. Yeah, great, thank you. Thanks for the answers. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by Council Members Cornegy, Deutsch, and Barron, and now we'll have questions from Council Member Holden, followed by Council Member Adams. Thank you both for your testimony, and uh, First Lady, this is a great idea. I think uh, Thrive NYC, we'd love to see it succeed. Um, at least when, uh, when Susan Herman was at our last uh, mental health uh, hearing, 
Um, she said, we're seeing the benefits in the subway. And uh, it's coincidentally, uh, that week, we were getting tons of complaints of people being accosted, attacked, uh, harassed by homeless individuals in our, in our subways. And there were a bunch of high, you know, big, many stories about this, the eight-year-old getting punched in, in the head um, by a homeless individual. Um, and I'm interested in these mobile teams, that you have 50 mobile teams. Uh, are they operating mostly in the subways or everywhere? Um, I just want to take a step back and, and, and um, say that I understand your concern and, and the, the pain um, that, it, it, that you must feel, that many of us feel when we are dealing with someone who is suffering. Um, not all the people who are on the street or in, in the subways uh, who appear homeless are, are necessarily uh, mentally ill. Um, that's important for everybody to understand. It's because they're experiencing homelessness does not mean that they are mentally ill. Um, DOH has long provided services for those with serious mental illness, and Thrive's goal is to, to complement those services, not, not compete with them. We, sir, we are uh, enhancing services that already exist. And everything that we do in Thrive is, is working to either prevent or to intervene or to provide support to people who are in crisis or, uh, or after crisis. Susan, would you care to add to that? I think the situation in the subways that you're describing is troubling for everybody. This is yeah, because people concern. feel trapped. People feel trapped in the subway. So this is a concern to everybody. But I, I don't. How do you? I just want to ask before because I'm running out of time. Um, how do you measure success in the subways? I mean, because people, I think most New Yorkers, 90% might say, we're not seeing a difference in the subways. And so I think public safety has to be a priority, especially in the mental health area. Public safety, number one. Because especially when those doors close on the, on the subways, we're trapped by a, an individual that can explode at any time. So it's just a matter of time bef before you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I mentioned this, but we need a really big initiative on that area of public safety. I understand your concern, share your concern. However, it is important to remember also that the people who are uh, mentally ill are more likely to be victims of, of crime and violence than perpetrators, um, more likely than the average person, actually. Um, and so when there is an incident, it does have an outside, outsized impact um, because, of course, it's all on the covers of our newspapers. Uh, this is something that we would enjoy exploring with you going forward um, because it is, it is important, um, but we all have to be part of the solution. Susan, would you like to add to I that? I just want to, as and when we met and we talked about this, I think it was important to talk through that when you do see somebody that you're concerned about, you can call 311, you can use the app, and there are mobile teams from DHS that will come and will work with that person to try and get them the help that they need. That's important for all New Yorkers to know, that help is available. Everybody gets uh, resources, they get information, they're offered assistance, and of course we want to have safe subways. And New Yorkers can do something, though. They can use that app. Right. Just how do you measure success on the subway? That's what my, my question was. Uh, how do you do that? If you take the person off the subways, off the streets, get them the help, if they just refuse to go, how many of those do we have? Um, I mean, there's a number of questions that we have, uh, especially in the subways, and that's why I, I wanted to address that. We do not have a subway focus program right now, but we are happy to explore that with you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Adams, followed by Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, First Lady. So glad to see you again. Uh, thank you very much, Director, also for all of your work. And uh, thank you for your outreach in Queens, as uh, we've seen each other a few times out there uh, doing what Thrive NYC does. You've also changed the face of mental illness, and I thank you for outing that, uh, that issue of mental illness and this, this condition that so many face and so many have to wake up and deal with on a daily basis and lived with and loved ones have to live with also. I think that so many people feel freer to speak about it 
freer to look for help, which is even more important. But I wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'm not going to take up a whole lot of time, just basically one question. This is such a comprehensive vision. And in working collaboratively with so many different agencies, how do you really uh, drill down and get that data that is necessary? I think that really all of us are looking for and a multi-million dollar effort like this. How do you drill down and collaborate? Who collects the data for Thrive? How is it collected? And where exactly is it stored? Is it public knowledge? I don't know if it's on a public site anywhere. Who handles all of that? Um, Thrive was intended to be aggressive, innovative, science-based, um, and in response to a, a very complex problem. Uh, but we have data. Um, I can tell you that, um, just give you a few examples, that 80% of the people who take mental health first aid are, are, they report that they're using their new skills to help others. 33% of them say they use their skills every month. 99% um, of the Department of Education's pre-K teachers and staff say that social emotional learning has improved their teaching. Um, they are all in, they want, they, they, they love this program. Um, and we have fewer criminal justice interactions and hospital visits. Um, there are more services. Only one person was arrested out of 1,000 people who are helped by our co-response teams. 95% of those people were connected to services. They receive counseling. They're given, re uh, given referrals to programs or transported. I mean, this is hard data. Uh, we know that people are being helped, and they're being helped where they are. Susan, would you like to add to that? Can, can I, I just ask, Susan, before you go on, how was that data collected and is it yes. published somewhere? Susan will address okay. that. So as, you, as you've heard, we have over 400 ways of measuring what is happening with Thrive. All of those metrics are being refined. I just got to Thrive a little over a month ago. I'm looking at these metrics, trying to make sure that they are still the right measures for each of these initiatives. Um, and then these metrics will go up. They will become public. Any specific time frame? Can we drill down a little bit closer to when that would be so that other people can take a look at that and I would be able to say to we're, my constituents, here it is? We're happy to give you these. These have already been given out uh, to the press. But before they're put online, they'll be refined. They'll be tweaked to make sure that they're current, that it's appropriate. They'll be up within a couple of months. OK, that's what I was looking for, a couple of months. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Gibson, followed by Councilmember Torres. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good afternoon, First Lady, and good afternoon, Director Susan Herman and OMB. I appreciate you being here. And a lot of my colleagues have really echoed the same sentiments that um, I feel, and I really thank you for this very ambitious plan and really this blueprint to really address mental health across New York City. Uh, 15 different agencies, about 55 different programs. I think many New Yorkers, as well as the Council, I'm grateful to have today's hearing, because before today's hearing, a lot of the information that we're hearing about today has not necessarily been shared with the council. So when you talk about performance measurements and indicators, and I recognize we're talking about people um, in emotional distress and certainly in need, but certainly $250 million that we're spending, we want to make sure that the public understands what we're spending money on, um, because many times they may not understand how they can get help through a lot of the different elements you've described. So my office, we've hosted mental health first aid training. I've had about four focused on the CBOs and youth, LGBT youth, to make sure that our constituents are equipped. Um, I've seen announcements with the fraternals, uh, NYPD and others, sororities and different things. But after that, I wanted to ask specifically about the media and the messaging. So are we really projecting the success? Are we sharing this information with the public? What does that look like? And then certainly I wanted to understand further the community partners that we're working with. I understand and agree that we have to approach this from a holistic perspective and go into neighborhoods that have have not really been serviced, but do it in a different way, not the traditional way, going to the local supermarkets, the bodegas, the clergy, the churches, the small businesses. So what does that community partnership look like? And then lastly, the oversight of the city agencies. Every agency has a component, and I wanted to make sure that 
our administration is following up with all the agencies to make sure that these programs are being implemented as we continue to move forward. Better question. Want me to repeat? Well, the, I guess. Could you just what is the, the what is the, the specific question, question? The first question the first question is messaging so as we make announcements on all of our new efforts are we equally focused on measuring the success but talking about how we're saving individuals from overdoses how we're helping those with maternal health services what is the messaging that we're doing around thrive nyc well we certainly can do better and more and we intend to do that going forward um, but certainly all of our, any time we launch a new program that is provided to the public, we try and amplify through social media and, and other means, but we can always do more, and, and that is our intention going forward. Uh, Susan, would you like to add? I think if you're, if you're asking also, what, what is it that we're looking at? What are we trying to get across? We have, we believe that we have to be more comprehensive about our approach to mental health, that this is a shared responsibility. This is something that all city agencies share. This is something that we share with community-based organizations. We share this responsibility with elected officials. So in the beginning, we looked at reach. We looked at how many people we were serving. We trained over 100,000 New Yorkers in mental health first aid. That's significant when you look at the size of New York City. 100,000 more New Yorkers feel more comfortable not only talking about mental health, but pointing people in need to the right place. We've answered over 500,000 calls, texts, and chats through NYC Well. That's a lot of people that we're reaching. We have mental health service corps members over 250 of them in these mental health sh care shortage areas throughout New York City. We are reaching people. We're serving people in our senior centers. We're serving students in our schools. We are reaching people in places and in ways that they never have been reached before. That message needs to be amplified and we will be doing that. And I hope I would like your help and assistance in doing that, happy to come to your district, happy to provide more opportunities to amplify that message. But we have reached people, we are touching people's lives, and that's important. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and Council Member Torres. Thank you, Chair, good afternoon. Um, you know, as a city, as a state, as a country, it seems to me there's no set of people whom we're failing, Councilman Torres, right here. There. <laughs> It seems to me there's no set of people whom we are failing more than the seriously mentally ill, who are often left to die on our streets or languish in our jails and in our hospitals. And when the chairperson asked how much of the Thrive NYC budget is going toward the seriously mentally ill, I, I believe the first lady said all of it. And I want you to understand, I don't, I don't take even mild mental illness lightly, right? I, I've suffered from depression my whole life. I take an antidepressant every day. Mm -hmm. It enables me to function and succeed as a person and as a professional. But how the city services me mm -hmm. is quite different from how the city should service someone who's seriously mentally ill, mm -hmm. right? Which is right at the intersection of chronic homelessness and chronic over-incarceration and chronic opioid addiction. And, and so I wanna ask that question again, like how much of the budget of Thrive NYC is specifically tailored for the most seriously mentally ill in our people in our society? The reason I say that all of Thrive's budget is tailored to that is because it's very difficult to say, oh, this, this is a percentage of our population that is seriously mentally ill. How are you defining that? If you didn't take your depressant every day and, and, and you were a victim of, of violence or something, you could be in that category tomorrow um, very, very easily or, or certainly within months. It is, um, important for us to prevent these diseases from progressing to crisis. Um, that's the bottom line. We do not want to see people um, in, in crisis. We want to make sure that they're getting the treatment, the services, the support that they need so that the disease does not worsen. And, and that is why I say all of our programs are focused on SMI because they, they do. We, we, our, our, our 
point is to make sure everyone has a place to reach out, everyone has an opportunity to make appointments, to, uh, to talk with someone uh, where they live, where they learn, where they worship, and, and it's about education too. We want to make sure that family members um, know the, the signs, the symptoms of mental illness so that they are able to get their, their loved ones, their family members, to service early on so that it does not become a crisis situation. Crisis situations don't happen overnight. Um, it takes time. And, um, and when mental illness is, is untreated, um, we end up with um, these tragedies that, that and, and tragedies and anguish and pain that, that none of us want uh, anyone to experience. Susan, would you like to elaborate? I understand uh, that it's very uh, tempting to say there are so many people that are seriously mentally ill and that's the only place we should be focusing. It's very, and that's not my position. I, I, don't, think, I don't think it was. Yeah, no, I don't think it was. Not. I just want to be clear that and really amplify what the First Lady said. We are and Thrive is working with people to build resilience, working with people pre-crisis, working with people during, and we can talk about that, as well as helping to stabilize people afterwards. I think it's important to say how pioneering and groundbreaking this program is. We haven't looked at this issue in a comprehensive way before as a city. There's hardly any other city that's taken, there isn't any other city that's taken such a comprehensive approach because we're trying to prevent and mitigate mental illness before it reaches that point. Some can be prevented, some can be mitigated. In terms of what are we doing to the, the programs that are specifically working with seriously mentally ill, we'd, go, we'd look at not only NYC Well, which is still serving as a suicide hotline, but we would also look at many of the other investments in the health department that are focusing on the mobile teams that we talked about. Now, I'd like to ask David to um, amplify that. Yes, Council Member, I think what you're asking is, within the Thrive budget, what is really geared toward people who are in crisis and are, are, are more likely to be experiencing that issue, and it's over $30 million, and that goes towards the sorts of programs that Susan was highlighting around mobile teams um, uh, and, and co-response teams. But outside of Thrive, there are also many other programs that are happening that are specifically targeted to that population, including the Sport of Housing New York, New York 15 program, what's happening in correctional health services. So, um, and, and within the health department, $300 million of their annual budget is actually for those types of programs for the SMI. I want to add that we're also treating, um, we're also making sure that that there are opportunities for people with co-occurring disease to get the treatment that they need. So if someone has an addiction, but they also suffer from anxiety and depression, that they're able to get those treatments, uh, get that treatment uh, at the same time, as opposed to having to go one place for the addiction and another place for the anxiety or, or depression. I squeeze in two quick questions. Um, I know the diversion centers are fall within Thriver NYC. One of them is going to be in my district. I am supportive, even though it's opposed by the local community board, because I want to be part of the solution. Two questions. What kind of offenders are going to be referred to the diversion center? And second, if it's only low-level offenders, do we have a strategy? You know, the numbers in Rikers Island have fallen dramatically, but the proportion of seriously mentally ill, as defined by the city, has risen, and so do we have a, a mental health strategy for providing a supportive alternative for the seriously mentally ill who happen to have committed serious offenses? And those are my questions. So, so the diversion centers will be in the 2-5 and in your district in the 4-7 precinct, and the, the idea right now, the way they were structured, we believe is, is presenting an alternative that has never existed before in New York, and that is to give um, officers an opportunity to offer help and service to people who voluntarily want to come um, and seek care and support. The, um, the idea, the concept from the very beginning was that this would be for low-level offenses, we would look to see whether they can serve people in that precinct, whether they can expand 
beyond that precinct or whether it really is filled just with that population. The idea always was to get them up and running, serve that population, people who have either committed low-level offenses or the officer is aware that person sees some prob problematic behavioral problem and offers assistance. Um, the idea always was to see how they're doing after a few months, several months, see whether that population or the criteria could change. And I'm, I'm, I'll end here. I just want to, you know, just like we have supportive housing as an alternative to traditional housing, I, I would love for the administration to imagine what a supportive alternative to traditional incarceration could look like. Mm -hmm. Because in my opinion, environments like Rikers are criminogenic and conducive to more mental illness, not less. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the extent of my questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And before we go to Majority Leader Kumbo, I just want to ask you, um, in 2009, there were 97,000 calls to 911 about emotionally disturbed persons. And in 2018, there were 180. Uh, thousand. So, what do? Uh, how do you respond to to those numbers? And is that an indicator or, of the failure or success of the program? One of the things we know that it could be a, a recognition that that services are available and people are calling more because they have a better understanding of of the better the mental health services that are available in our city. Uh, Susan? Yeah, I think it's actually interesting. There's a lot of conversation about how the, the numbers are, are going up, both for EDP calls and for homeless. And if you actually sort of chart it over the last few years, both of those numbers have kind of flattened out. There are very minor increases over the last year. So they went up, and they are almost flattening out at this point. There, there's, it's, it's hard to know why there are more calls for emotionally disturbed people. There are also more calls to 911. There could be many reasons for that, but our goal at this point is to train officers to respond to these calls as well as possible. That's what we're doing through Thrive, through the CIT training, through the co-response teams, through the diversion centers. Okay, thank you. Councilman, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, First Lady, for being here today. I uh, just wanted to talk about when I first heard about Thrive NYC, I was very excited, and with the creation of the mayor's office to end gun violence, wondering how, um, with working with many of our cure violence providers, there seems to be a, a disconnect with how some of our cure violence models are working in our district, but also working with uh, Thrive NYC. And so wanting to know, is there a plan to incorporate in the cure violence model a way for those providers to be able to access mental health services uh, for the individuals in our community that they're serving? And then the other one that I wanted to focus on was um, in issues in terms of the NYPD. We saw with the tragic killing of uh, Deborah Danner in the Bronx, as well as Saheed Vassal in my district in Crown Heights, um, individuals that were known to be impacted by uh, mental health uh, challenges, knowing that those cases and others exist like that, how is Thrive NYC working to make sure that circumstances and situations like that do not happen, particularly with people that we know um, suffer from mental health challenges? Well, yes to your first question, and uh, Susan will elaborate. Uh, to your second uh, question, I mean, those are, those are really painful tragedies that, that um, we wish could have been prevented. And we're working on that in, in a variety of ways, um, by working with the NYPD to make sure that they have the tools, the resources, that I, all of them will be trained in crisis intervention training by, uh, I believe it's 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, that is very important to us. The other thing that is important to us is, is to make, sh make sure that families know that there are resources available um, to them for their loved ones. Uh, families have the opportunity to be the first first responders um, by, by uh, tapping into the city services that are available so that, that um, you know, we, they don't have their loved ones in crisis. 
um, that's very important to us, and that's why we're working with the faith communities, that's why we're working with Brothers Sisters Thrive and so many other uh, organizations to make sure that, that people know there is somewhere to turn, there is something that you can do. Um, and uh, Susan will talk a little bit more about what they're doing uh, through the NYPD and uh, also with the NCOs who we, we want to get involved in, and, and helping on a neighborhood level because often, you know, the people in the community know, right? They know the people, they know what's going on, um, and th this should be, um, it shouldn't be on any one person to have to make sure that someone who is who is sick, somebody who's not well, right. gets to the care that they need. I, I think because one of the challenges that we have in the city council is that um, currently when situations like this happen, when an issue of gun violence happens, unfortunately, we in the council are expected to be that mental health provider. Right. And so incident after incident that happens, I feel like there's a disconnect between families um, getting that service and getting the support that they need and often turning to us and to our offices in that way. And I, if you could, because I, I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding what's actually happening and what's going to happen in the future. So if you could talk about the cure violence model. Um, I have, for example, GMAC and Crown Heights SOS in my district. How are you effectively working with those organizations? Because if I were to think of where Thrive NYC would be most needed, it would be with those individuals and organizations that are working directly on the front lines with our community. We're, we are open to, we have about 400 community partners right now. Um, whether any of them are a part of the crisis management system, I'm not sure, I mm -hmm. will check that. But what I will say to you is that I would very much want to work with the people who are engaged in cure violence because they're working with people on the ground. They need to know about mental health first aid, they need to know about NYC well, and they need to know that help is available, basically. They need to know where they can refer people. So Got it. the health department, as you know, manages the cure violence program. So they are integrating this work into that work. If it needs to be bumped up a little bit, we will do that, and if you have suggestions of how to do that, I'd be happy to talk with you. Would love that. It. Just want to squeeze in one little more about the gang violence database. So when I think of the gang violence database that unfortunately exists, one of the things through hearings that we've talked about are these are the young people in particular that are the absolute most vulnerable in our communities and are the most acceptable, susceptible as a result of that of committing violence within our communities. Has there been a thought in terms of how the database um, could be utilized as a tool to provide mental health services for children and teenagers and young adults most in need. It's a very interesting idea to look at who, who is most vulnerable to violence. We certainly know that people who are victims of violence are more likely to be susceptible to mental health challenges. That's been proven. We also know that people who are, um, suffer from mental illness are more likely to be victims of crime than the general population. So we will be working closely with the police department. We'll be working closely with our CVAP advocates to make sure that they know that mental health care is available, not just victim advocacy. I think that's critical. And I, and I just want to say, I think that ultimately the reason why this hearing is even taking place is that we have exacerbated the circumstances of working in silos. Mm -hmm. So I feel that because you're doing this work, we're doing this work, and the architecture of this building says that we're on different sides, that we don't actually come together and have a thorough understanding of what's happening on each side. Yeah. So I hope that, because this is very unprecedented to even have a hearing such as this, I hope that through this experience, we're able to figure out ways to break down the architectural design of this building and educate one another about what we're doing, what's working, what the program is, how our offices can interact with it, how we can connect our constituents to services. I feel that part of that challenge is that, and I hope that through this experience that we're able to break those barriers down and really come together to effectively, there, there's like a wealth of experience on this council body that's not being tapped into. 
So I hope that we can, through this process, move forward in that way and think of collective ways yeah. to do so. Yeah, so forward thank to you. That. Yeah, that is, that is um, absolutely our, our approach in terms of um, Thrive. It's a collaborative process and uh, a collaborative approach to mental health. And we look forward to working with you. I mean, we, what's come evident, what's have been made evidently clear um, during this hearing is that everyone wants more. Um, we're, we are just beginning uh, in this, this process. Hey, thank you. We have um, questions from three more council members. Council member Traeger, followed by Deutsch and, and then Barron. Thank you, Chair Drum. Welcome, First Lady, Director Herman, OMB. Uh, let me just share with you the most up-to-date information I have as Chair of the Education Committee. There are 1.1 million students in New York City schools, yet our schools have 1,335 social workers, 2,958 guidance counselors, 560 school psychologists. We have more NYPD school agents, 5,500, than guidance counselors, social workers, and school psychologists combined. Let me be very clear. We are failing to meet the social and emotional needs of our students. And I appreciate your words, First Lady, earlier about how you value social workers and guidance counselors. But why then would the administration impose a freeze on hiring them in our schools? There, there is no freeze on hiring them, to my knowledge. I, and I have asked directly about this question. Um, that is news to us because the chancellor testified here recently that there is a freeze. I'd like to ask uh, David to address that. So the partial hiring freeze isn't a closed process. It involves discussions with all our agencies and, and uh, we're focused on our key priorities. Uh, we really believe we can be fiscally responsible and at the same time accommodate the needs and priorities uh, that our agencies are, are trying to deliver on. Respectfully, that the council put in over $4 million in the last budget to hire more counselors and social workers, and we had to battle the administration to get them hired. And they only hired them, in, most of them in January, where half the school year went by. Uh, now, I have a list of questions in the interest of time, if I could ask respectfully, if folks can just kind of take some notes because I, I'm on the clock. Um, Throughout this year and into next year, new children uh, and family and treatment and support services will be available under New York State Children's Medicaid. These therapy, rehabilitation, and family peer support services will be available to children and youth covered by Medicaid in their communities. For those in geographically isolated, under-resourced communities like Coney Island, this program has the potential to significantly inc increase access to mental health care and reduce barriers to persistence. How will Thrive NYC work with eligible prov uh, uh, providers, schools, and communities to encourage and facilitate initial evaluations and care coordination for eligible children and families? Uh, what are the DOE-focused initiatives of Thrive NYC? Is there a direct service component to any of these programs? We've heard from NYPD school safety that there has been an increase in 911 calls for mental health and behavioral crisis in schools. So can you please describe the work and outcomes of the Im Improved School Climate Initiative led by the DOE? How many educators and school-based staff have taken each of uh, the programs under mental health training for school staff, Cognito at Risk, making educators partners in youth suicide prevention and youth mental health first aid? How many of the 130 community schools in our city have developed school-based mental health clinics since the, the, the beginning of Thrive at NYC? For the cohort of 44 schools in the School Mental Health Prevention and Intervention Program, can you please describe the, the contracted services with mental health providers available in those schools and how school mental health managers facilitate those connections? Are you meeting your targets for teachers, assistant teachers, powers, and social workers who have attended social mo emotional learning uh, PD? Are there metrics on utilization of social emotional learning interactive tools and guidance in pre-K for all sites which are not receiving more intensive supports? How many school mental health consultants are there? There are 900 schools I think we've heard being served by a mental health consultant. What is the average number of schools in their portfolio? How frequently are consultants expected to visit the schools in their portfolio? And can you please expound on the deliverables of each of these uh, domains in their service uh, delivery? What is their training? Are they licensed clinical social workers? And is there data, on, and the last question, is there data on how many successful connections to care were facilitated by these consultants in persistence and treatment? 
So that's, that's a lot a of questions. Yes. It's all at once. Thank you. Only in two minutes' time, it was a oh. teacher trick. <laughs> Thank you um, so much, Council Member. Yes. We, we give us a list, all right? And we are, we're committed to making sure you have all that information. I, I will be happy to provide you that, that, that list, but I will just quickly follow up on just one key item. I hear about these school uh, mental health consultants. Are they licensed clinical, clinical social workers uh, that provide direct services yes. to our students? Yes. Yes, but they work, I, I would say, and, and please correct me, we'll bring somebody up, to, they, they work with the principals, they work with the teachers primarily to make sure that the students and the schools as a whole are getting the services that they need. So, they, were, right. they were initially conceived as being able to um, evaluate the schools to see what's available. Um, to, to make assessments as to what mo you know what more we should be doing in those school communities. Uh, when we launched Thrive, we didn't have any data, or we didn't have much data to work with, and so these consultants were brought in uh, as as health educators, as people who could evaluate and assess these communities to figure out what next steps should be taken. So, respectfully, First Lady, I'm being told on the ground that when school leaders contact Thrive that the per per people they speak to in the borough support offices are not licensed cl clinical social workers. They cannot provide direct services. They can provide staff trainings and workshops and meetings, but schools need direct services. And so I'm confused when I hear that there are clinicians available to children when we're hearing the exact opposite from the school community. Th these, I'll let you go. We're going to bring up uh, our let's, Scott, Scott from Lou, would you like the to Office from? of School Mental Health. Yep. Just before you start, we have to swear you in. Okay. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. And state your name for the record. Sure, Scott Bloom, Director of School Mental Health Services. So these consultants were brought in, as uh, folks have just talked about, to connect the schools to mental health agencies in the community, to also bring trainings to the school staff, to map out what kinds of gaps in services they had. But are they licensed clinical social workers? Not all of them. They're, they're not. Either clinical, they're social workers, mental health counselors. So they could not provide direct services to, to our children? At this point, no, but they do lots of consultations. They do trainings for all the teachers on site, and they bring that information back as we said, so sometimes we do then bring clinics in, depending and, on the situation. And what is their average salary of these consultants? I'd have to get back to you on that. Right. I'm just repeating to you as the chair of education committee what I'm hearing from students and educators on the ground, that there is a crisis in terms of our social emotional uh, climates in our schools, and they are requesting urgently direct services in their schools. I think they've, they've gone to many workshops and PDs, and they've seen many PowerPoints, they need a licensed person in their school to help our children. Right. Well, we bring lots of linkages and referrals to the, to the um, agencies in the community, to the students, and that's something that I'm sure we'll bring back and, and talk with the DOE. I'd be happy to follow up. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Um, welcome. Good afternoon. It's been a long day so far. I was going to say good morning. But anyway, um, so, first of all, Susan, I want to thank you uh, for reaching out, um, uh, reaching out to me in my district office, and for um, going out to different events and spreading the word um, of what Thrive does and giving out the information of the services NYC Well provides. Um, so, you know, no one, no one here is denying the work that Thrive does, uh, how they help people, how they reach out to people. The the question, the whole question. The whole question is, is that uh, with the budget that Thrive receives and all the non-for-profits and city agencies that receive the funding, that over the last three years, uh, my opinion and per my personal opinion is, is that every single of the 8.6 million New Yorkers, no matter what language they speak, he or she speaks, should have already known what services, um, a, um, what service, how to reach out to New York City well and what Thrive is. Like I mentioned in previous hearings that in my district, when I walked into a packed room, only a few people raised, 
the hands about uh, knowing, having the knowledge of Thrive NYC. So, but um, nevertheless, now I see, uh, Susan, that you're, you're still, you just came in a month ago and you're doing, um, you, you're being proactive, not reactive, so that's, that's good to see. So my question here is, is that, do you know how many sexual offenders reside in New York City in uh, all categories of level one, two, and three? I would be asking the police department that question. I don't know that question. Does uh, Thrive assist with mental health for sexual offenders? Sexual offenders are, can access Thrive clinicians just as anybody else can. So if um, does, does Thrive work with our district attorneys and court systems um, for people that need mandated uh, treatment and for those um, that uh, don't have the mandate of taking treatment but cannot afford a, th a therapy because therapy, they're very costly. Mm -hmm. Does Thrive do that work um, by providing those services? Because usually when you have a sexual predator, un unless they're mandated, uh, they want to pick up the phone to say, listen, I, I need some mental health services. So what kind of work does Thrive do uh, with sexual offenders overall? Thrive does not work specifically with that population, but anyone who calls NYC well can make a, a connection to a therapist, psychiatrist, or a social worker. Um, it, it is available to anyone who lives in, in New York City. That service is available. We don't, but we don't ask, uh, you know, are you a sexual offender before making those connections. So by working with the court system and by working with the district attorneys, then you could have that knowledge of knowing if someone is a sexual offender. I mean, I just came out um, speaking, bringing out to light about um, banning repeat offenders from entering the subway with the, with the mayor uh, agreed um, with what I was doing by bringing this out to light. So if the administration and the governor and my colleagues, uh, some of my colleagues in the state agree on this, um, why isn't it that uh, Thrive does work uh, with those that have uh, these types of um, a mental illness and who are sexual offenders? So uh, why doesn't Thrive working with that population? I mean, if you, uh, we are, as the First Lady said, we're serving all New Yorkers. We have identified several particular populations that are at particular risk of mental illness. And if you have a particular program in mind, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. Is um, being a sexual offender a mental illness? I would really defer to experts to talk about that. Do we have any experts here? <laughs> I, you know, I'm sure that many people have mental illness who are sexual offenders. I'm not sure that all do. So um, in other words, so if someone that is a sexual offender and calls 888 NYC well, what would then happen? If they're, if they're asking for assistance, if they're asking for a clinical assistance, if they're asking for a group, we are, we refer people to- Someone calls up, I am a sexual offender. I need services. I think they would refer them to whatever is available in New York City. So, so what services does- I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but we can look into what's available for but you, Does Strive have the services? I'm looking at the list here of funded services. Does, does any, I didn't see anything. Well, you're, you're looking at a list of particular Thrive initiatives, but I want to, I'm glad you asked that question because I want to make it really clear that NYC Well refers to hundreds and hundreds of programs that aren't necessarily funded by Thrive. We take advantage of every resource in New York City. So those are just Thrive funded programs. So that I just doesn't want, mean that if someone called NYC well, they wouldn't get access so to I, more. So I just want to end off, because my time is up, uh, I just want to end off by saying that, um, you know, I think that we need to come up with some type of plan to provide um, mental health treatment for sexual offenders here in New York City. And I think that needs to be part of the conversations, because I don't think that putting someone in jail for long term is helpful. Um, we need to make sure that working together um, as a city and, and the state and making sure that there are 
free services and resources available for those that are sexual offenders and to keep them away and to keep them off the streets uh, with, by having that mental um, uh, health resources to st this way to keep them away from their uh, prey, obvious, um, hopefully. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, last but certainly not least, Councilmember Barron. Thank you, perfect timing. Zigging and zanging from 250 back to here. I want to thank the chair for this hearing and thank the first lady and the panelists for being here. I wanted to particularly ask a question about CUNY, because as you know, I'm the chair of the Committee on Higher Ed. And you had an initiative in FY, I believe, 17 and 18, which you called the CUNY Mental Health and Digital Platform. And my understanding, it was an 18-month initiative that, had, that was held at seven CUNY campuses, and it provided CUNY students an opportunity to be able to find services, information, and resources. It had an online health and well-being support network that they offered, and CUNY students were trained to be mental health ambassadors on their campuses. And I don't see that there's an allocation for that initiative. I know it says it was 18 months. So I wanted to ask, was it successful? Do you plan to have it revitalized? Are you going to do it again? And if it was not successful, what do you think were the issues or the areas where it could have been improved? You take it. Oh. Thank you for that question. I, that program was actually conceived at the outset to be a time-limited program to test different ways of reaching students, whether it be online, whether it be through an app, or whether it be through peers. And we tested out uh, what was effective, what were effective means of reaching students. It appeared that the most effective way was student to student, and our hope is that CUNY is incorporating that awareness into their work. Um, it was a pilot program. We are talking to CUNY about the next step. Um, our hope is that their counseling centers incorporate this information into their work. I think that that's an important uh, issue because, you know, as we're looking at changes that uh, the education secretary is proposing to Title IX, that we need to be very well aware of the fact that there may be persons who are involved in those kinds of interactions that would certainly benefit mm -hmm. from having those kinds of resources readily at their fingertips. Yeah. And CUNY serves uh, 500,000 people, so we really want to make sure that students who are dealing with the stress of going to school, paying tuition, and paying all of those associated costs with tuition, yeah. childcare, transportation, food, housing, all of that, that they certainly have access to those kinds of services. Couldn't agree with you more. Our hope is that, and we will continue to be in contact with CUNY, that they incorporate the information that came out of that into their work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes the Finance Committee's hearing on Thrive's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget. The hearing will continue.